Good morning. Hi. Welcome. It's so great to see people at an in-person event and a hybrid Zoom event. So hello at home as well. Uh, I'm Dr. Jason Porter. I'm the Kayla Skinner Deputy Director for Education and Public Engagement at the Seattle Art Museum. Thank you for joining us today for our first Saturday University lecture in a hybrid mode. It has been two long years since we last had a lecture in this auditorium. And thank you also to those of you who joined us via Zoom today. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that Seattle Art Museum respectfully acknowledges that we are on indigenous land, the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people. We honor our ongoing connection to these communities past, present, and future. Our current Saturday University lecture series takes place monthly on second Saturdays through June 11th. The 10 lectures on plunders and collectors share stories of recent archeological discoveries, expeditions and explorations, collecting and repatriation, shipwrecks and more. Please look out for Gardner Center's e-newsletters and sign up for future lectures. To our longstanding partners, the Jackson School for International Studies at the University of Washington and the Elliott Bay Book Company, I would like to give our special thanks. Today, we have the pleasure to hear from Natasha Reichel. Natasha will speak for approximately 50 minutes, and then Fung Ping, our Foster Foundation Curator of Chinese Art, will moderate the Q&A. We'll take questions from those of you who are in the auditorium first, and then if time allows, we'll also take as many as we can from our virtual audience. So if you are at home, please type in your questions in the Q&A window, not in the chat, at any time during the program, and we hope to get to your questions. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Natasha Reichel, Curator of Southeast Asian Art at the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. Natasha specializes in the art and architecture of Southeast Asia, with a particular focus on Indonesia and island Southeast Asia. She holds a BA from Yale University and an MA and PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and is the author of the book, Violence and Serenity, Late Buddhist Sculpture from Indonesia. Natasha has curated numerous exhibitions on a wide range of topics, including, including Javanese puppets, Southeast Asian jewelry, the art of Bali, and 17th century Jesuit maps. Her exhibition currently on view at the San Francisco Asian Art Museum is titled Weaving Stories, which draws from the museum's collection of Southeast Asian textiles and uses archival images, macro photography, and poetry to illuminate the role of textiles as markers of identity, objects of status, and symbols of faith. Today's lecture draws from her recent exhibition, Lost at Sea, Art Recovered from Shipwrecks. It traces the pathways of ancient Cham sculptures and 15th century blue and white ceramics from Vietnam to the ocean floor and to San Francisco and asks poignant questions about collecting ethics. Now, without further ado, I'll turn the podium over to Natasha. Thank you very much. Um, I was planning to lecture without my mask, but if anyone in the audience has any objections, please just raise your hand. Great. Thank you so very much for the introduction and it's really great to be here in Seattle. Um, I'd like to thank everyone here at the Seattle Art Museum for being so welcoming and helpful. I'm especially excited to be here because I remember hearing from the curators so much about the planning and reconception of the galleries here, but I didn't get a chance to visit in those few months it was open before things closed down. So I'm really looking forward to going this afternoon and taking a look at the galleries. Um, more than anything, it's really nice to speak to a room full of real people, as well as the people on Zoom, but it's been so long and all of us have been staring at our screens and so welcome back. Please come every Saturday and enjoy the wonderful things the Seattle Asian Art Museum has to offer. So I'm here to speak today about an exhibition at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. Um, that opened in November of 2019, and because of the pandemic, it had a very long run and closed only last spring. 
It was a small exhibition that was set in an experimental gallery in the museum, a space where curators have a chance to put together shows that juxtapose objects in unusual ways or tell stories that we're not able to tell in other parts of the museum. This show focused on just 14 objects in the museum's permanent collection. So one of the questions we often get um, from visitor to the, visitors to the museum, especially from school groups and students, is how did this or that object get to the museum? Um, and a big conception, because much of our collection is, um, or a good deal of it is, is works on stone and many of it works from Indian temples is this conception that everything was, you know, how did it come? Is it all loot? Is it all plunder? Um, so the exhibition that I put on traced the paths of two sets of objects, both made in the region of Southeast Asia that is known today as Vietnam. They were created at separate times by separate peoples and these works and the ships that they were transported on came to rest at the bottom of the ocean, only to be excavated decades or centuries later. One group of objects was on a ship that wrecked right off the coast of Vietnam in the 15th century. The second was a steamship that wrecked off the coast of Somalia in the 19th century. Both wrecks were excavated in very complicated expeditions Objects retrieved were brought up, then desalinated, cataloged, and then sold at auction, and later donated to the museum. For as long for as long as people have crossed the oceans, ships have foundered. UNESCO estimates that there are at least 3 million undiscovered wrecks covering the ocean floors. Each shipwreck is like a time capsule containing on board all the things that were owned, traded, used, treasured at a single moment of time. What remains when a ship is excavated, often after hundreds of years, it's often just the durable materials, things made of metal, of ceramic, or stone. Other cargo, paper, small wooden objects, textiles, foodstuffs, natural products like spices and aromatics, with rare exceptions, do not survive long periods underwater. There we go. Shipwrecks tell us about the movement of people and objects. This map shows some of the trade routes in the South China Sea, the Gulf of Thailand, and the Straits of Malacca, waterways through which for centuries, for millennia, trade flowed, especially between Southern China and Southeast Asia, as well as within the archipelagos of island Southeast Asia, and then further west to India and beyond. Initially, this exhibition was going to talk about ceramics found in shipwrecks. In our collections, we have ceramics that are thought to come from over a half a dozen Southeast Asian wrecks. Most of these, but not all, these are just a few examples, most but not all, date from about the 14th to 15th centuries.
Quite an experience to do this <laughs> hybrid mode. It's a brave new world, folks. <laughs> It's not advancing the slides. Yeah, do you, do you just, can I just say next, would that work? Okay, terrific. Um, okay. Um, so initially this exhibition was going to be about ceramics that were in shipwrecks, ceramics that were in wrecks throughout Southeast Asia. Um, but then we also had recently received a very different set of objects um, that were found in a shipwreck. Two large stone sculptures from the Cham Kingdom that was located in what is now central and southern Vietnam. Juxtaposing these two sets of objects gave us the opportunity to explore the many ways that art moves via trade, colonial looting, treasure hunting, scientific or commercial ex excavations, auctions, and donations. It also gave us a chance to consider maritime law considering shipwrecks, differing opinions concerning marine archaeological excavations, and the ethical concerns of collecting objects made for trade versus objects that were taken from architectural settings. Next. On one side of the gallery, we told the story of the Hoi An shipwreck. At some point in the later, mid to later 15th century, a ship sank off the coast of central Vietnam. Next. We do not know exactly what the, what the vessel looked like, but this Japanese scroll depicting an 18th century Thai sailing vessel might give us an idea. The wooden remains of the ship, I just said earlier that wood often doesn't remain, but sometimes if it's sort of in an anaerobic environment, um, the large um, parts of the, the hull of the, of the ship will remain. And looking at this from the Hoi An, we could figure out that the ship was very large, about 30 meters long by seven meters wide. The hold was divided um, into partitions, into bulkheads that were watertight, which is a characteristic of Chinese junks. The wood was teak, most likely from mainland Southeast Asia. The hull was constructed with wooden dowels rather than uh, metal nails. And that's a, the wooden dowel is a Southeast Asian way of making ships while nails is more Chinese. And finally, all this information led um, the archeologists to consider that it's probably a kind of hybrid Chinese Southeast Asian vessel and most likely made in Thailand. Next. The ship was laden with ceramics, over a quarter million pieces that had been produced in kilns in northern Vietnam. Um, for thousands of years, potters along the banks of the Red River Delta in northern Vietnam had been producing pottery. These ceramics were primarily used locally, while China, the kilns of China to the north, produced ceramics that were exported across the oceans to Japan, Southeast Asia, and beyond. But after China enacted a series of bans on private maritime trade in the late 1300s, the production of export ceramics increased from Southeast Asia, filling this gap. By the mid 1400s, large numbers of ceramics were being exported from Vietnam to Indonesia, the Philippines, as well as making their way east to Japan and as far west as Turkey. Especially popular were ceramics with cobalt blue decorations against a creamy white background. Vietnamese potters took inspiration from the shapes and patterns of Chinese blue and white wares, but also produced forms and decorations unique to Vietnam. Next. It seems likely
Um, could you could you go back? Back? Yeah, there we go. It seems likely that the ship was making its way down the coast of Vietnam when it wrecked early in its journey. There's no evidence that the ship had hit a reef or had a fire, which are two very common causes of shipwrecks. But what archaeologists did discover were seeds of late summer fruits, long gone thorny chestnut and gawk, that were preserved in a jar on board. And that led scholars to believe that perhaps the ship may have left late in the trading season and been caught in typhoons when it capsized. The wreck remained undiscovered until the 1990s, when pieces of 15th century ceramics started to show up in shops in Hoi An, presumably being sold by fishermen who were trawling the ocean floor and bringing up these ceramics in their nets. Then two Japanese dealers were caught at the airport with suitcases full of these ceramics. The Vietnamese government decided to try to pinpoint where they were coming from. Next. After discovering the site of the wreck um, near some islands about 10 miles offshore of Hoi An, a commercial salvage company or two commercial salvage companies worked with the Vietnamese government and an Oxford marine archaeologist or archaeology team to scientifically excavate the site of the shipwreck. The excavation lasting from 1997 to 1999 was fraught with all sorts of complications. There was infighting among the parties involved, an out of season typhoon destroyed the team's initial efforts, and there was a need for something called saturation diving um, to reach the deep, deep wreck, which was over 230 feet under the sea. Next. So this meant that archaeologists needed to use a method of excavation, which meant that divers had to stay underwater for periods of up to 69 days in a 12 foot long pressurized capsule, going out to excavate for 12 hour stints and then coming back to sleep. Next. Eventually, the ceramics and other objects were raised and they were desalinated. Vietnam kept the ceramics they wanted and distributed them between national and local museums. And the remaining ceramics that were not badly broken were sent to auction at Butterfields in San Francisco. Next. The 15th century ceramics on board ranged from very fine wares made for elite consumers, like the dragon shaped ewer on your left, now at the British Museum, or the, the blue and white phoenix shaped ewer um, on your right, which is now at the National Museum of Vietnamese History in Hanoi. And the way these objects were chosen after the shipwreck is I believe Vietnam got um, right to keep any object that was unique and then 10% of anything that was a duplicate and then the rest went to sit to be sold at, at auction. But far more numerous, next please, than these elite wares were pieces of utilitarian high fired stoneware that were found in hundreds like these rimmed plates or bowls with quickly painted designs. Next. Some of the ceramics on board seemed destined for island Southeast Asia markets, like Kendi, these handleless um, ritual pouring vessels that have been found in great number in Indonesia. Next. Likewise, large dishes thought to have been made for communal dyeing in Muslim regions were also on board. Some like this one show traces of enamel on top of the blue and white. Many depict motifs um, that are common to Chinese ceramics, like elements of landscapes, lotus petals, birds, and flowers. Next. But Vietnamese potters were especially skilled at depicting fanciful composite animals. Here, like a, there's a horse with floral spots and bat wings who's flying through the clouds. Next. Other smaller objects on board also point to the imagination and whimsy of the potters. Water droppers in the shapes of frogs or pufferfish, and the image on the upper right there um, is from your collection, um, or delightful objects like a crab-shaped box or a small cup in the form of a parrot and peach, and I believe you might have one like the lower right in your collection as well. 
Next. During the excavation of the Hoi An shipwreck, a number of cobalt ewers with um, unglazed central medallions uh, were found. And you can see on the far left that in that medallion, a parrot is depicted on branches. This form of spouted vessel was probably used, um, well, it wasn't known really very much at all in Vietnam until this shipwreck. So the shipwreck um, unearthed evidence of this form being made. Um, the ewers were probably used for pouring wine and were based on Chinese models. So you see two Chinese models on your right, one earlier and one later. They all were most likely originally based off West Asian ewers made of metal. Next. The object raised give us not only a glimpse of the vast extent of ceramic export trade, but also a notion of the life on board the ship. Undecorated earthenware pots made in Thailand were found on board in the cruise quarters and included a vessel which contained fish bones. Um, somehow they were preserved and Archaeologists think that this might have indicated that some of these vessels, these earthenware vessels, contained fish sauce, a very common condiment in Southeast Asian cuisine. The earthenware pot you see here has this large sort of drumstick shaped encrustation attached to it. When we x-rayed it, next please, we found inside it a um, the handle and tang of a knife. So this again is material coming from the cruise quarters rather than the hold where the export shipwreck material was. Next. Also recovered in the cruise quarters were containers made for the use of the custom of chewing beetle. These containers were used to store the mineral compound lime, a powdered substance that is combined with a beetle leaf and a areca nut to make a quid that was once commonly chewed in Southeast Asia and is still used in parts of Southeast Asia today. A thin paddle would be dipped into the hole at the top to obtain the powdered and then spread on the leaf. In this example, the handle is formed like a piece of the trunk of the areca plant um, with nuts and beetle leaves entangling it. The presence of these pots on board in the crew's quarters suggests the sailors were likely Southeast Asian, perhaps Thai or Vietnamese. One of the objects, next please, donated to the museum from the shipwreck was this concretion. Concretions are conglomerations of sea life, sediment, and other objects that form underwater, especially around metallic objects. When it was donated to the museum, it looked like this. As time passed and the piece was exposed to oxygen, objects that were in the, next please, objects that were in the interior that were made of metal began to oxidize and the piece began to slowly fall apart. Visitors to the galleries would find a security guard and ask like, what is going on over here? Um, so while having works of art fall apart is generally not something we encourage in the museum, it did provide us a really fascinating opportunity to see what was inside the concretion. So we took it off view and did some research. Next, please. Some of the things that can be seen are along the oh, one back Along the top here is a piece of antler, a piece of deer antler, which likely might have been used as a knife handle, or in some parts of Asia, antlers, parts of antlers are also used for medicine. Next. Next, okay. Um, you can also see the bottoms of pots, which have this distinctive brown wash, one of the signs that the ceramic comes from Vietnam. Next. Embedded in the um, concretion were many small lidded containers, some only an inch and a half in diameter. Were they used for cosmetics, for spices? We still don't really know, but there were hundreds on board. And before I started working at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, I worked for a brief period of months for Butterfields, the auction house that sold the Hoi An ceramics. And part of my job was cataloging material, but another part of it was physically assembling the lots for sale at a giant warehouse in Singapore, where we spent 
dozens of hours just trying to find the lids that matched the bottoms of these tall, they'd all been separated. And so it was like a giant puzzle game. This image, next please, shows some of the corrosion of metal in the interior of the concretion. The ring-like forms you see suggest that there was perhaps a metal chain inside the concretion. Next. When we took some x-rays, um, we found interesting shapes within it, including this small thin disc with a square hole, presumably a Chinese coin. Next. Finally, there was this greenish rectangular object, a carved perforated stone. Despite reaching out to several Vietnamese scholars, we still don't know what its function or use was. Could it have been part of a small altar or perhaps part next of some kind of an incense burner? We still don't know. And I'm very uh, happy to receive any suggestions of what it might be if anyone knows. Next. So now we move to the other side of the gallery. And so while the vessel carrying the Hoi An ceramics was clearly a ship made for trade, um, it's like a huge pottery barn vessel going across the ocean. On the other side, the ship we explore um, was very, very different. Next. It was a 19th century steamer called the Mekong. Now the Mekong was a liner in a French merchant shipping company that traveled between France and Asia. Next. After the construction of the Suez Canal, ships began taking this much shorter route through the Red Sea and around the tip of Somalia before crossing the Indian Ocean to Sri Lanka and on to Southeast Asia, China, and Japan. Next. The opening of the canal in 1869 greatly aided European colonial powers in their efforts to take over territory in Asia. Next. When it sank, the Mekong's hold was full of crates of stone statuary. Statuary that had been taken by a French colonial doctor, Albert Maurice, who had been stationed in Vietnam in the 1870s. A naturalist as well as a medical doctor, Maurice went to Vietnam at the age of 24 as an assistant doctor in the Navy. A few years later, in 1875, he was assigned to the embassy in central Vietnam. It seems likely that he went out by horse cart um, to some of the ruined temples in the region near the embassy and gathered stone statuary that he intended to ship home to France. Next. The temples, the temples from which the statues were taken were built by the Cham people. The Cham were an Austronesian seafaring peoples who established a series of independent kingdoms or capitals roughly from the 6th to 16th centuries. From the 11th centuries, kingdoms led by the Viet people in the Red River Valley um, of the north began military campaigns, expanding their ter territory southward. By 1832, the last independent Cham kingdom was annexed by the Vietnamese. Cham people still live as ethnic minorities in parts of Vietnam and in Cambodia and elsewhere, but more Cham people today live outside Vietnam than within it. Next. At one time, central and southern Vietnam was dotted with Cham Hindu and Buddhist temples, complexes. By the time the French invaded Vietnam in the 19th century, many of the Cham temples were already in ruins. Of the 250 archeological sites that were documented by the French colonial government, only 50 remained somewhat intact in the late 19th century. Some of these structures were destroyed um, through conflicts with the Vietnamese, or the Khmer, the native Cambodians, or through decay over time. These sites have been further damaged by the French and American wars in the 20th century. Next. We do not know precisely where these two sculptures, the two that were donated to us came from, but it's likely they were decorative elements of 12th century brick temples. Next. The temples closest. Hmm. That seems like one 
image was in. Okay. The temples closest to where Maurice was stationed are called Tapdoi and date from the late 12th to early 13th century. Um, two of what were thought to be three original towers remain standing today. Next. The sculpture on view on the exhibition on the left depicts three fierce faced serpent heads looming over what appears to be the top of a headdress of a now missing figure, perhaps the Hindu bird deity Garuda. The mystical, I mean, the mythical deity Garuda uh, and serpents or Naga often are depicted together and can be found in this configuration and other charm sculptures like you see here on the right. Serpents play a protective role in a lot of local stories and myths, and an ancient Cham inscription describes that the Cham people were stemmed from the marriage between a Hindu priest and a serpent or a Naga princess. Next. Sculptures of multi-headed serpents decorate the corners of towers at some Cham temples, including the temple at Tap Doi, but the dimensions of the sculpture from the shipwreck do not fit any of the parts of that temp of the remaining temples, leading scholars to assume it comes from a now destroyed third structure. Maurice collected over 30 sculptures and sent them via two steamships where they were destined for his hometown of Lyon. One shipment bearing the ailing doctor himself and 10 statues arrived, although the doctor died shortly thereafter at the age of 29. At this time, Cham sculpture, Cham art was not very well known in the world outside of, of um, Southeast Asia, not in France yet. Um, and so the sculptures, these crates with sculptures were stored in the basement of a museum unopened for 56 years until they were finally unpacked and transferred to the Musée Guimet. Next. The second ship bearing the rest of the sculptures, um, the Mekong, wrecked in Somali waters in 1877 as the vessel was making its way to the Suez Canal. Next. The wreck was very well documented in the French press. You see an image here and next, some more. Almost all the passengers survived and much of the cargo was reported to have been taken by local Somalis, except of course for the heavy stone statues that sunk to the bottom of the ocean and were forgotten for a hundred years. Next. Then in the 1990s, a Belgian marine archeologist, Robert Stenwy was going through archives in Paris and came across the name of the ship and information about the cargo of Cham sculptures. Stenwy gained permission from the Northeast Authority of the Republic of Somalia to conduct the excavation with the help of a commercial salvage company. By international law, the sculptures belonged to Somalia, but Somalia was in a state of civil war at that time, which problematizes the ethics of negotiating such a contract. Next. The 1995 excavation much like the Hoi An excavation was very difficult, but for different reasons. Working from a war-torn region required security and made supplies difficult to obtain. They also had to find the ship, which was, um, had gone down in a region where there were dozens of other vessels that had wrecked. When they finally located the correct ship, and I think it was like the last of, of 10 or 11, um, it was not in deep water, but very close to the shore. So the excavators had to deal with the constant crashing of waves as they did their um, excavation. Next, the excavated statues were raised, desalinated and went to auction in Amsterdam. Some of the statues were bought by a San Francisco collector who eventually donated them to the Asian Art Museum. Next. The objects from this shipwreck provide an opportunity to think about many of the ethical issues involved in collecting objects that were clearly not made for trade. When Elmer Maurice took these sculptures from the ruins of a Cham temple in 1876, he was employed as a doctor at the French embassy of the kingdom in the kingdom of Da Viet. The Viet rulers who were not Hindu had no incentive to protect the ruined Chan temples of their historic enemies. 
The French, who had attacked and annexed southern Vietnam in the mid 1800s, colonized this region and the rest of the country by 1884. So as illustrated by the Smithsonian's recent announcement about the return of their Benin bronzes to Nigeria, today museums across the country are reassessing the objects in their collection, especially those taken under war and colonial control. Next. Today, the Cham descendants of the makers of these artworks are a stateless people. Some still reside in Vietnam, where most have, committed, have converted to Islam, but others live as minorities in Cambodia, Malaysia, Thailand, and elsewhere. Some Cham people who remain in Vietnam complain, have complained that the Vietnamese government has transformed their ancient temples into tourist attractions. Situations like this complicate issues of repatriation. What might be the mechanisms of repatriating objects to a stateless people? Are there other types of restitution? Next. The final section of this excavation explored laws of the sea and the ethics of marine archaeology. Next. When a shipwreck is found, who has the rights to its content? The legal answer often depends on where the wreck was found. If it's found in international waters, it's often finders keepers. But if it's in a country's territorial waters, it's that country's to keep unless the ship's owner makes a claim. So that's the legal answer in a nutshell. But another factor in that determines who ends up with the contents of a wreck is the wealth of the country in whose waters it was found. Wealthier countries can afford scientific excavations of shipwrecks. Countries with fewer resources are more likely to depend on salvage companies that excavate a shipwreck in exchange for the profit of the sale of its contents. Such international economic disparities impact the quality of scientific research and can result in the cultural heritage of a less wealthy country being sold at auction to the highest bidder. Both Vietnam and Somalia required outside financial and archeological help to excavate the shipwrecks found in their waters. Next. Marine archeologists have very different views about what should be done to utter with underwater sites. Some of them believe that these sites should be left alone until a time when they can be excavated without destroying the sites and dispersing the material. Another contingent thinks that you should excavate sites, but it should only be done scientifically and without any commercial purpose. And a third contingent thinks that both these models are unrealistic, that sites are always in danger from natural phenomenon or from looters, and that many poorer countries cannot afford to do these scientific excavations in their waters, and thus are at a disadvantage in their ability to protect or retrieve this cultural heritage. This third contingent thinks that excavations must be joint ventures between commercial salvagers, governments, and archaeologists. Next. Both the excavations um, that I discussed today were completed before the UNESCO Convention on the Protection of Cultural Heritage that convened in 2001. The UNESCO Convention argues that marine sites should as often as possible be left alone and should only be excavated scientifically and without any commercial intent. Although the Hoi An shipwreck was a scientific excavation done by a team from Oxford, a final report of the excavation was never published, and the auction of the materials of the wreck did not make enough money to pay for the expenses of the excavation. Next. One of the things that makes ceramics or any artworks monetarily valuable to a dealer or auction house is their rarity. When I worked in Singapore, um, one of the men who was working on the salvage operation told me about unscrupulous salvagers who would intentionally destroy duplicate objects that they found in order to make the value of the remaining objects worth more when it went for sale. You can see in a case like this how the rarity of the artworks play into a commercial market in a way that wouldn't have happened if the wreck was being raised purely for scientific or academic reasons. Unfortunately, many countries in whose waters wrecks can be found cannot excavate or protect these sites from looters. Only in recent years 
have museums begun to seriously consider underwater sites in the same way that they think of above ground archaeological sites and rethink both acquisitions and exhibitions of excavated materials. Next. Some of you may remember the uh, controversy surrounding the ex exhibition of materials found in the Bliton shipwreck, a very historically important 9th century Arabian Dhow that wrecked off the coast of Indonesia, off the island of Bliton. And it had on board over 60,000 objects from Tang, China, both ceramics and also beautiful um, materials, beautiful objects made from gold. The site, like the Hoi An, was originally found by fishermen who began to just bring up things and they appeared on the market. And then the Indonesian government hired a commercial salvage company to excavate the site. The bulk of the material was sold to the Singapore government and you can see a fabulous exhibition of this material um, on permanent display at the Asian Civilizations Museum. And some of the material remained in Indonesia. When the Smithsonian was going to mount an exhibition of this material though, they belonged to a consortium of museums, which was part of their ethics were never to knowingly exhibit artifacts which had been stolen or removed from commercially exploited sites. So they ended up not going ahead with the exhibition. Next. Finally, the exhibition in San Francisco asked the viewers what they thought about the show and the questions it raised. The answers were diverse and well considered. While many argued for the repatriation of objects taken under colonial rule, others acknowledged how complex issues and stories around provenance can be. Certainly the first step in exploring these issues is diving into the history of objects in our collections and thinking deeply about the circumstances of our collecting in the past and what we collect in the future. The history of these objects show that issues of provenance and patrimony are complicated and that every object has its own story. These stories can only become more complex as people continue to move, intermingle, fight, plunder, and trade. Next. So thank you so much for listening. And I would love to open this up to a discussion and questions. And I think we're taking questions from the audience first and we're not gonna pass a mic. So just if you have a question, um, yell it loudly and I'll repeat it so that people on Zoom can hear it. And I'm sorry, I can't really see you because of the lighting, but I'll try. Any questions? <laughs> okay, I see one. Okay, so the question was, do I have opinion of, of during these of these three models that are, are talked about by marine archaeologists, which to do? Um, I think it's super difficult. In the ideal case, you know, there would be funding for, you know, UNESCO funding for any country in the world to have these sites um, scientifically excavated. I, I do think that the world is large and it's just probably impossible to protect all these places from looting. Um, and so I think the second option is the one that I'm probably most in favor of right now. Any other questions? Are you getting questions over there? Um, so yeah, let's warm up a little <laughs> bit about this. Uh, we haven't seen each other in such a long time. so. Um, I, I do have, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for this incredible presentation. It is, uh, as one of the, the uh, Zoom folks here, written is so nuanced and very articulate. And this is certainly an incredibly uh, difficult topic to discuss uh, in this way. So, you know, I do want to highlight the fact that um, it's very welcome to have this kind of approach to counter what you always hear in the media and the news uh, depicted as, as um, uh, objects in museums uh, always arrive as a result of plunder or looting. 
sort of the sweeping brush approach that I think we do need to complicate the situation because our, our lives as curators are quite complex and we do need to bring this more nuanced ideas towards the objects in the collection, even at the same time as creating, as you just did for us, this uh, wonderfully transparent process uh, that you have displayed uh, uh, to it during this talk and also, of course, in your, in your um, exhibition. So uh, I think the topic of shipwrecks is such a very fascinating thing. And I do want to point out that just uh, very recently, Ernst Shackleton's Antarctica shipwreck, <laughs> the Endeavor was just found. Uh, which is, a, a, of course, this is the most momentous occasion. So I think it does highlight, help us highlight the interests uh, that we, everybody has on shipwrecks. Yeah, uh, and so, just uh, interesting yeah. also the places where they're found, because in, in Southeast Asia, in the warmer waters, you know, things disintegrate faster. But I mm -hmm. think like the Shackleton, because it's so cold that they had like some pristine conditions of the yeah, I so that was my question. Uh, there's a question about, you know, some more technicalities, which is what is involved when you mentioned desalination a few times, what is exactly involved with that? And you mentioned the incredibly difficult process of having to live in a bell, yeah. <laughs> uh, a bell jar, I guess, essentially for weeks on end and having to sleep there at night. That yeah. must be incredibly claustrophobic. <laughs> yeah. They, so I, I wonder if you can say the a little bit more about that. Yeah. So I am not an expert on the desalination process, but I believe what happens is you take the object out and you first put it into water of about the same salinity as mm -hmm. it was in. And then you, you go through stages of putting it in less salinated water. That I'm not positive about that, but I think that's what's going on. And as far as the divers and the excavators, I, I, when I learned about that, it just really blew my mind because not only you know are you in this tube, but then I believe when you're going out there, you need like heated suits for these very long stints. So um, the fact that they were just able to do this, and this again, this excavation was, done by a Oxford Marine Archaeology team. So they had, you know, the whole region, you know, gridded out and were very carefully documenting what objects came from what part of the seafloor or what part of the shipwreck itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The question was how expensive it is to excavate. And I'm afraid I have absolutely no idea. Um, I think it entirely depends on the difficulty of the excavation. I think the Hoi An excavation ended up being incredibly difficult, not only because of this type of saturation diving, but like they did a whole season where their boat and everything just got like blown over by a typhoon and they had to start over. So mm -hmm. I think it kind of depends. I'm sure there's some which are are not that, but I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's a huge variety. So some are completely encrusted with things, but I think it kind of depends how they were packed and how they were found. So sometimes bowls would have been packed inside larger bowls and sometimes, you know, the sand got in there and protected them. So it entirely depends. You'll find some where the patterns are almost all worn away and some which still have this very sort of almost shiny clean surface. So it, I think it depends on, on where in the ship it was and whether it got, you know, pushed out and trawled by a, by a fishing net and all those sorts of things.
Okay, I'm going to try to summarize this question. It was basically about provenance and looking back at that story of the, um, the, the, the sculptures that had gone on that first shipment to France and had ended up, you know, in a basement for 50 years. And the question was kind of about how are museums today dealing with issues of provenance and, you know, are, are museums complicit in having a blind eye towards where things come from? Is that sort of the gist of it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So why, so the, adding on to that, why did it take 50 or 60 years um, to discover it? I think we have to move back to, you know, the late 19th century when this came. And the reason I, the main reason it was in the basement, I think for 50 or 60 years is the person who had shipped them died before they arrived and no one knew what to do about. But there were lots of other shipments. If you go to any museum in France today, you'll see fabulous artworks that were taken from Cambodia, Vietnam, all of the colonial, um, you know, old colonial. And I, I don't think anyone had any qualm in taking them. At that point, people thought that it was their right to. Um, Today, I think most museums are really starting to be um, very serious about provenance. I know at our museum, we basically aren't collecting much ancient material at all anymore, um, and certainly not material from architectural sites. I think that's true among a lot of museums, especially in the United States. Um, there's um, I have to say in the time I've been at the museum for almost 20 years and the seriousness in which people are thinking about these issues has, has changed tremendously and all for the good. Yeah, I, I do want to add a little bit to that. And I, I agree that um, the issue of provenance is very much foremost on many museum curators' minds today. And that is rightfully so. So there are um, certainly uh, legal definitions. So for example, uh, the UNESCO definition, the ruling is that uh, objects have to have a paper trail or some kind of breadcrumbs from at least the 1970s. So if somebody got something, uh, bought something from say um, a vendor from 1980, then the museum could not acquire that work for a collection. So that is certainly sort of, but certainly legal definition and museum best practices are not necessarily uh, the same thing. So it is certainly a lot of places today have uh, even stricter definitions than 1970 rules. So uh, I know Asian Art Museum is one, and um, actually many US museums have those a much higher, adopt a much higher standard today. So these are um, within the uh, Art Museum Association, which defines best practices. Uh, this is very relatively common today. So uh, certainly some objects, um, require greater due diligence, for example, the kind of archaeological materials and, and um, excavated materials, tomb objects, those, of course, have to have great scrutiny. So I think it's really interesting. Um, this, I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about uh, Hoi An, which, of course, um, is the collaboration between um, marine archaeologies, uh, was it a marine archaeologist or was it a commercial it was, uh, company? Um, an Oxford marine archaeology yeah, team. Yeah, right. And the, uh, in combination with the government sanction. So yeah. I thought that was a very interestingly yeah. um, negotiated a, situation. Yeah. <laughs> what was interesting about that is, so I think I said earlier that I believe the sort of um, agreement that was made was that Vietnam would keep 
any unique objects and then 10% of anything of which there were duplicates. So as I said before, there were hundreds of, of rimmed plates with a bird painted on them or, and what it actually ended up is that Vietnam didn't want 10, they didn't want, you know, 2000 rimmed blue bowls. And so they actually sent that off to auction. So this is a situation where, you know, they, they, you know, having a hundred of those was enough for them. Um, so it's an interesting, I think what it speaks to is like for every object, this should be a negotiation between, you know, the parties who are interested. You know, I think there's um, repatriation is one thing, but there's other types of restitution um, that are also important and uh, other alternatives of borrowing materials or, you know, do you need to own it? Can you have it on loan from someplace? And uh, these are all sort of structures which are really difficult because every country is, is different and every country has its own rules and regulations. But, you know, working toward that type of model, I think, would be ideal. Mm -hmm. So the situation that we have now at the museum is that there were a pair of Ghazni panels from um, Afghanistan that it came to our attention that they were not, you know, collected in, um, I think before they were collected after 1970. And so um, we are deaccessioning them, but um, we're, they're sort of in this limbo state because we're not sure if sending them back to Afghanistan at this moment of time is the right thing. And when we spoke to the um, officials here in the United States, they weren't sure if that was the right thing to do at the moment. So there's, there's as I said before, each object has its very singular and unique story and um, needs to be thought of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think just attitudes toward collecting have changed over the years and considerations of them have and we've had things offered to the museum which don't meet that 1970 guideline, but we've been able to connect them with people in Southeast Asia, governments of Southeast Asia to say, you know, we can't, we don't want to accept this, but is this something you might be able to? So the question was a sort of why do we think we as a culture have such a fascination fascination with shipwrecks and has it to do with the fact of so much of the stories of our heritage have to do with people coming here or going there via ship and I'm sure that's part of it and and also the fact that just it captures this one moment in time. You know, you can know exact, if you know the date of the shipwreck, you know, you know, often we're finding out that a certain form of ceramic that we thought had only been made at this period of time was actually, you know, made earlier. So you, you can determine, it's a great historical tool because of that. There's a question in the back.
Okay. So the question was talking about um, how I had discussed how a lot of, how the economic circumstances of the country had a great deal to do with whether they were able to afford to have shipwrecks in their waters excavated um, or, you know, probably also countries filing claims for works of art, um, how much the, you know, international economic situation has to do with it and how much um, the economic situation of the world today has to do with the past colonialism of um, Europe over much of Africa and Asia and suggesting or putting up a model that, and this is sort of what I talked about of not only repatriation, but other um, ways of, of, you know, trying to, um, other ways of restitution. And um, the questioner was talking about models in which wealthier countries like Europe could help fund these things. And that was, you know, I think that would be great if there was, you know, a, a UNESCO model or something where um, it, it, you know, countries wouldn't have to depend on commercial salvage companies because, you know, there would be a pot of, of money that they could go to. Um, an ideal situation, whether we're going to get there or not, is I really wish you had a microphone um, because I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to um, repeat your question, but I think it has largely to do with what is the um, responsibility and ethical responsibility of all of these wealthy institutions and academic centers to um, to do more than just say, you know, we'll research the provenance of this piece, but to do sort of to, to put money where their voice is speaking and um, do something. And I think it's really super difficult because these are all, you know, very old institutions that are part of, you know, the capitalist system that we live in. And um, I think there are a lot of curators out there who are trying to, um, who are interested in these issues and would like things to change, but, you know, the places we work with are very founded on a very old model that um, are, is not state funded, but is, you know, dependent on donors and um, the capitalist system makes this very hard to do.
So I think the question is um, how much more common or to what efforts are museums making to sort of think more deeply of these issues and to think of them um, in, in other um, ways. And I think this is happening and a lot of it is happening through, um, we have a program at the Asian, which is called the Rehistory Project, where we dove deeply into, well, both the history of the museum itself and its founder and the problematics of his past, as well as looking at the, the um, reliefs we had from Afghanistan. And we did a really fascinating program, which I'd love to give you the link for, which we brought in a bunch of scholars who both, you know, talked about the history of how it was collected, where it was collected, but also talked about other ways of, that museums and organizations can do restitution of working with local communities in these places of supporting arts and, um, you know, uh, archaeologists in these countries. Um, so other things that can be done um, in that line. It's very dependent on different museums, but I think a lot of people and a lot of, especially, um, I know a lot of curators are interested in this, Ping might be able to yes. speak more. Uh, it's very fascinating. I mean, the, certainly these kinds of, uh, I guess you could call them meta exhibitions in a way because they reframe objects uh, along ideas rather than say arrange them according to you know where they came from or time period so in uh, so your exhibition is in fact an ideal example of such new approaches towards presenting concepts rather than facts so I, I completely agree it's a very welcome um, uh, idea in order to just change the conversation a little bit um, but I'd like to, if you don't mind, I want to get back to the topic at hand. Um, so here's a, something very interesting from one of the Zoom audience. Uh, they propose that there is a book called Dragon Sea by Frank Pope. I don't know if you know this book, but it's supposedly an, a read, a very excellent read on the details about the Hoi An shipwreck excavation and that the chief of the excavation team uh, somebody by the name of Mensum Bound so happened was also on the recent excavation team of the Endeavor. Yeah. So that's a little interesting little bit of tidbit offered by uh, somebody online. Uh, there's a question uh, more specifically about the charm people. So it's you mentioned them very interestingly as a group of People uh, are they an ethnic group? Uh, did they are they did they originally come from India and why they ended up in Southeast Asia? So um, they happen to be stateless today. Yeah, but no, they they're, see they're clearly not. they're a very specific group of people. They're not originally from. They're an um, Austronesian speaking group, so um, more linguistically affiliated with the peoples of island Southeast Asia than the peoples of mainland Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. So probably were related, you know, at some point in the very distant path with these migrations of Austronesian speaking people down from Taiwan through much of island Southeast Asia um, and then over to the coast of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And um, they, you know, there's communities in the United States as well, but they are very much of a minority community in Vietnam today. Mm -hmm. um, this is so, uh, it's so interesting to talk about, uh, I think where objects ought to end up. So everybody has this question um, where, you know, what happens when you excavate something, right? So, um, did you say earlier that there are about 3 million shipwrecks? 3 million undiscovered shipwrecks is what um, UNESCO estimates in so, the ocean. And I don't know if that includes, you know, there's hundreds which are like in Lake Superior or, you know, freshwater places as well. So, um, but yeah, there's a lot. So 3 million time capsules in mm -hmm. essence. Um, so, you know, if you, even if you do, uh, take them up from the ground or do you take them up from the from the ocean bottom i know there are some there's one that was taken up in a that is in the chinese museum the entire ship so it is uh you know a huge endeavor and costly but they were able to take up the entire thing 
and keep it under sort of this uh, in a, basically in a giant bathtub um, under pressure. <laughs> so uh, the, the technology that's available is out there. So the question is how to find resources. And then more, more, much more difficult is about the ethics. Um, how to mm, figure out what is the right path and then who owns these things in the end, who gets to take up the responsibility, both financial and um, in terms of how you display something. So uh, I very much engaged that. Yeah, go ahead. Not that I know of. In Southeast so, Asia, is there? There was the question to repeat was, mm -hmm. um, are there organizations that help countries um, preserve or preserve. protect? You mean, um, do you mean sort of broader sort of international organization? Uh, as far as I know, there isn't any international group that does that. Mm -hmm. um, what was the, can you say maybe a little bit more, if you know, since you were in Singapore, um, working on your giant puzzle of putting covers <laughs> to bowls, uh, uh, what was the role that the Asian Civilizations Museum in Singapore played? You on, know, are they a private museum or they are a national museum? I think they're a national museum, but yeah. I, because I think the, the, um, the Blitung, those Tung ceramics were bought by the Singapore government. So I'm pretty sure it's a, um, mm -hmm. a, a national, national museum. museum. Okay. Are there any other questions from the audience? Well, we have successfully survived our first hybrid event. <laughs> Oh, one more last question, perhaps. Could you repeat the question? Uh, uh, yes, you're a little bit hard to understand with the mask. Yes, so uh, you're, I think, I believe I heard you that you're expressing that if it were not for the Hoi An, there would be very little surviving uh, of Vietnamese earlier culture. Mm -hmm. Um, there's examples of great, there's lots of great <laughs> Vietnamese art in Vietnam, obviously. Um, and I think there's also examples in other Southeast Asian museums. Um, a lot of the, um, their this Buddhist temple art from Vietnam, um, a lot of it has been looted and taken out of the country. Um, and is now in private hands. Um, but there's, there was also tremendous destruction in the American and French wars. So um, it's true that the knowledge from this, sh the Hoi An shipwreck did um, greatly increase both our knowledge of the extent, you know, the, the ships would have that much on board, but also the types of wares and the places where those wares were likely, you know, meant to be going. So it was very historically valuable. Thank you so much, Dr. Rookie.